Hoi hoi, hello and welcome to the Meet Maastricht podcast. I'm Katrina and together with our resident local Lucy, we will be exploring some of the amazing stories that make Maastricht so special. So sit back, relax and join us as we learn about our favourite Dutch city. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to episode 33 of the Meet Maastricht podcast. I have to keep track of all the numbers now, we're getting so high. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm with Lucy as always. What are we going to be talking about this week? Well, I I thought I'd I'd do another little uh, loop through the educational field <laughs> uh, again. We we have been talking about schools before a little when talking about the 19th century new religious orders in the city who yes. took it upon themselves to uh, to educate the, the the poor children especially of course there had always been education available for the rich children mm. but that was that was uh, basically uh, primary education and uh, what what I want to talk about today is uh, a specific type of education also generally not for the well to do but for uh, the common people the the regular people the <laughs> poor people and exclusively for boys for for quite for quite a long time when you look at the i was i was reading up about this subject and after a while it really started to grate me this, there's no women here no mum mum whatsoever but but uh, in the contemporary iteration of the school, uh, there are women. I have been looking at the website of the contemporary version of this particular school, and uh, uh, there were girls uh, woodworking and uh, yes. using drills <laughs> and uh, all kinds of power machines and just talking about their profession. Yeah. I thought, yes. Lots of fun things God. to play with. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ju- just just controlling a power drill is a bit of a job. So you know, <laughs> I, I have I have deep respect for that. But mm. uh, you know, that's the that's the twenty first century, and we we are going to start in the well. I think I'll I'll start the in the pre industrial era, really, to to sort of make clear where this school comes from. Okay. Well, in the pre industrial era. Uh, society was ordered in such a way that uh, a lot of people were a lot more self-sufficient than we are these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at any rate, most of the everyday material needs would be met by people in your own community. Of course, there has always been international trade and exchange, but you know, a lot of that would be luxury goods. But most of this stuff, you know, the uh, the food, the clothing, the utensils, the housing, uh, the machines, they would they would all be uh, made either by you yourself or one of your neighbours. And over time, of course, and, and of course, these the, these people who would who would have the specific knowledge of of working in wood or working in metal or producing cloth or whatever, they have very, very early on they have started organizing themselves into guilds. Yes. And you know, look around you in any medieval city, and you can that there are plenty witnesses of the wealth. Of the guilds, so they were they were powerful uh, entities in any urban community, and they would, depending on how powerful the city became, meaning how rich the city became, they would also wield political influence as well. So yeah, that's the that's yeah. the Middle Ages, and that's the early modern era. But with the advent of the industrial era, things stuff is becoming in increasingly mass produced yeah and then time and money are of the essence you know in the in the earlier uh, types of production time was not so important but quality was yeah stuff had stuff had to be good yes and as a young person as a child basically you would start learning with a master and you'd have to do that for years on end and then at the end of that training period, you would you would be tested on your and you would you would have to absolve the master test. So you would have to provide a sublime sublime example of your yeah. of your of your expertise and yeah. of your your capabilities. I mean, it sounds very similar to well, maybe not as probably as scary, but uh, apprenticeships and um, yeah, yeah the. 
people still complete and what I know yeah. in and people tend to be a little bit older now sometimes but I know my both of my grandparents well all of them probably left school at 15 to do that kind of thing work in a trade yeah. so it hasn't yeah. some things haven't changed as much as others <laughs> no this is the, you are right this is this is very similar but uh, the, the 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 quality of the workmanship in the in the pre-industrial yeah. area was pretty was pretty dazzling yeah also because the training periods were so much longer yeah you know and and uh, the generation you are talking about uh, at least has had extended primary education you yes. know they would they would they would only start getting into the trades when they when they were adolescents so you know yeah. 15 16 years old yeah and i imagine some of but, them were quite a bit more specific as well like very yeah. um particular types of crafts so but what what happened with the industrial uh, revolution and mass production of all sorts of stuff that 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 and in combination with the French Revolution that effectively put an end to the guilds yeah. but it also must have resulted in an enormous loss of practical knowledge and capabilities yeah. in in uh, you know vast swathes of the of the population and and it it was already early in the uh, first half of the 19th century that um, in Maastricht, there was talk of the need to uh, educate boys. All of this story is about boys. Yeah. Uh, apart from the last part, part of the of the tale, we are not getting into boys needing to be needing to be educated, needing to be trained in a particular trade to be useful members of society. Yeah. And uh, so, there have been a few rather there have been a few decades in the 19th century of different actors jockeying for position and uh, that means of course uh, power and money in providing this type of education i mean the uh, the city of maastricht had at its pri had as its primary motivation that it, it didn't have the money to you know be be extravagant about anything at all mm. the, the, the public city income was was too low for you know pretty much anything so they they weren't going to be able to fund a school yeah and there were in the field so to speak there were there were sort of competing factions there was a, a group of educator artists who were organizing um, evening classes mm. to teach young boys to draw and this is not to be understood as the artistic drawing although many of the teachers were actual artists yeah so there must have been the artistic knowledge and flair imbued in that education anyway but the point was to educate these people to become uh, the, the the draftsmen and the decorators in the ceramics industry. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, of course, the, the ceramics and the glass in the mm. 19th century was still extensively decorated and a lot of it by hand. Yeah. And uh, people had to, had to be educated to do that. Yeah, I remember we went to the um, the Delft pottery factory in Delft obviously and <laughs> uh, there was a man painting these really detailed designs but that's what it makes me think of the people who must have been so <laughs> so patient and talented yeah. to be able to do those kinds of yeah. beautiful and very expensive designs as well yeah you can you can see uh, pictures of this uh, uh, hand painting on ceramics going on in the in the sphinx passage in in maastricht as well uh, yes. where the where the history of the sphinx factories is uh, is shown yeah. and then you see that a lot of a lot of that painting is being done by uh, by women and girls ah uh -huh, okay yeah so i am i am not sure where where they got their training they must, <laughs> it must have been in the factory itself because this 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 yeah. early history of the trade school doesn't mention it at all mm -hmm. but anyway so there was this there was this group of of you know primarily uh, draftsmanship drawing decorative arts and it it took a while before that took on more the character of an actual academy of the arts but eventually in the 20th century that is what it evolved into mm. and of course also because the factories um, disappeared and didn't need this type of craftsmanship anymore that still left all the other trades and crafts uh, to be uh, provided for and um, well like after a lot of uh, shifting about and fights over money and ho 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 in 
19 and 11, they finally had uh, all their stuff together. Also because by now, the national legislature was uh, obliging all parts of the country to, to provide in particular types of education. So yeah. there had to be school for the, schools for the trades. So in 19 and 11, the Ambacht School, the trade school, was built in Maastricht. It's at the foot of the Wilhelmina Bridge in uh, Wiek. Okay. And, and the Euroscope movie theater has been built around it in the in the 1990s. Oh, okay. It's a it's a nice uh, brick building mm. designed by an uh, architect from Holland who copied the Holland Renaissance style with the bricks and with the the gables that look like uh, a stair. They, they they are pointed, but but as if there is a stairway going up. Anyway, oh. please include some pictures as usual, Katrina, so people <laughs> will understand what I'm. My architectural vocabulary is not good enough to help you. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd I thought I'd looked up all the relevant terms, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it is a very very Holland style by a Holland architect yeah. you know, in in Maastricht, which is not Holland at all, and you know, and it's anyway. <laughs> So it's it it sticks out a bit, but still, you know, we people just accommodated themselves to that. But uh, the architect also became the first director of the school, and he couldn't accommodate himself to his new surroundings. So he's only been here for you know about as long as it took to build the school, and then he went back to Holland uh -huh. with his family. Okay. And the 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 main feature of the history of the school in the building that used to be twice as big before they demolished half of it to build the, the movie theatre, the main theme has been consistently that it was too small. Okay. So uh, it, they, they started with, with 42 students in 1911 <laughs> and uh, it was already seven years later that they had to extend it and you know and of course there is an end to the amount of extensions you can do and there's also an end to the amount of boys and young men you can cram into one building <laughs> but you know it must it must have been pretty terrible and, and, and pretty ridiculous and yeah. unsafe and loud and you know yeah it's also very central sort of in the the area that it's in so I imagine it, you wouldn't be able to expand it too far because it's right sort of in the city. There would have been other mm -hmm. things happening and building around it. So <laughs> yeah, you'd run out of space pretty quickly. Yeah, and 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 it also always was a was a matter of funding. I mean, yeah. there, uh, there was there was some funding from from the government, but the school also had to run on the school fees the parents had. To, but uh, parents uh, who didn't have a high enough income, didn't have to pay a school fee. And of course, because of the nature of the school, quite a few of the students would be from poor families. And yeah. in the beginning, they had quite a bit of trouble also getting parents to actually educate their boys because a boy in school was a boy not working for a salary. Yeah. So that's, that that was a bit of a thing. And of course, you can imagine that, you know, must have must have been difficult. But yeah. um, anyway, they have uh, they have never they have never suffered from a uh, from a lack of students. <laughs> well, and it took it took them a while also to 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 figure out how how exactly the the the, the education was going to be provided. I mean, would they have the kids uh, working in 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 for for a boss during the day and come to school in the evening or yeah. would they alternate it or would they have the children in school all day and you know discussions like that and to an extent that has never stopped really I mean what they settled on is uh, everybody, everybody between 12 and 15 just comes to school every day all day yeah. and then after that they can go and have apprenticeships yes. you know, here and there and everywhere and you know ease themselves into a, into a professional life like that these discussions continue up to the present day. How to how to organize this? Yeah. Because you know, of course, there's there's lots of people who who are perfectly uh, capable in in all kinds of practical ways that you really uh, only bore to tears and 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 demotivate completely by an excess of books. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, there is all kinds of theoretical knowledge necessary to 
to adequately do your practical work. And and of course, in a in a contemporary setting, there's there's also lots of stuff like like uh, you know health and safety rules and uh, how to how to take care of your finances when you're self-employed. You know all the rules and regulations pertaining to everything else having to do with a, with your particular profession. Yeah. You have to keep up on the technical developments and you have to know how to deal with, you know, the the organization you're part of and the customers you have to deal with. So, you know, there's no there's no getting away from from theoretical concepts as well. No. Yeah. But that it 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 took professional education quite well the story of the of the school in Maastricht at any rate. It it it, it took a while for for that to to sink in. Because for the longest time, or for the longest time, for several decades, <laughs> all the teachers were not teachers uh, so much as expert, experts in their trade. Right. So uh, uh, a very good uh, smith or metal worker would be teaching the boys how to, you know, work the metal. Yes. But at a certain point, they they included, uh, I think, Dutch as a as a subject there there had to be something on you know the national language and then a qualified teacher came into the school and yeah. he was he was looked at as uh, you know this was this was funny and this was nonsense and this was <laughs> superfluous and why do we have to do this yeah um, but but this man has succeeded in over the years convincing his colleagues and and redirecting the course of the school in such a way that didactic became an important part of what they were doing as well so not so much well of course still uh, this this is this is how you work metal this is how you work wood but also paying attention to the way you uh, present the facts and the knowledge and the and the capabilities in such a way that it can be absorbed by an adolescent mm. mind. Yeah. So the pedag the pedagogy of it all, and then yeah. and then added onto that as well was also, and this must have been to a large extent the uh, the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, which of course is inescapable here, even even if it was it has always been a public school. But you know, of course, that is only a name. When when a city is so characterized by its by its Roman Catholic culture, yeah. there was also this influence, not not pressure so much, but influence to to also shape the moral character of the boys. Okay. Of course, quite a few of them would be from very poor uh, backgrounds, and then poor in every way. Yeah. You know, alcohol addiction and and poor food and no language capabilities, no no manners. Yeah. Ba ba basic civility and and the school the school did did its very best to provide that as well, to mm. to contribute to these these uh, boys not only becoming uh, useful members of society but also contribute to civilizing them according to the. Um, well, the the ideas at the time. Of course, we we would now think that's not what you're supposed to do. At the same time, of course, a school is a civilizing institution. Yeah. There's 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 not really any way around that. Even if you don't intend to, it's a it's a microcosm of society. People will be taught. It is yeah. you know. Well, even just you know having to cooperate with other people and having exactly. to. If if there's a sit down kind of lesson where you have to sit down and listen to someone and you might not mm -hmm. enjoy what they're talking about, <laughs> it's learning to yeah interact with other people. Do they do yeah. things like uh like mathematics and yeah yeah that, of course because I because yeah. I can imagine that being one of the important outside of the actual practical skills yeah. that that would be something that would be you know if you if you're a business person which most tradespeople have to be uh, mm. in their own way. Uh, you have to be able to do basic maths and yeah. be able to write. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, aside from that, quite quite a bit of construction work uh, demands that you have a grasp of these yeah, that's of, true. These, of these yeah. concepts. Geometry and <laughs> yes, yeah. I know my, like I said, my nan is a dressmaker and her geometry is far better than mine because putting bits of thing, <laughs> things together yeah. and cutting things and manipulating materials is yeah, a lot of counting and 
geometry yeah. and maths. So yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's but but of course that that would mostly be presented in 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 the form of okay, we we have this problem here with the window, and uh, here is here is uh, wood your material, and here are your tools, and uh, now how do you solve it? And I yeah. mean now now on YouTube you can you can find endless amounts of 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 lovely <laughs> lovely videos of of people who are capable of manipulating relating material in a way that is just absolutely breathtaking but it's you know it is all of this work requires all kinds of types of intelligence uh, working together to to produce something yeah so um, the school had had this uh, good educator as a as a as a director for for a long time and Mm. uh, I think that that must have that must have informed the 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 entire curriculum, but but in a not not in a how, how would you say that in a very in a very subtle sort of way. For mm-hmm. for instance, it would be customary for tradespeople to wear to wear uh, dark coveralls, so they they uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't really notice so much how how filthy they got. <laughs> and Trade schools would generally be uh, everything would be painted dark or would be or would be dark wood, and this particular director put put an end to that. But yeah. No, uh, we we paint the school very light in light colours, so uh, all the dust and all the smudges and all the filth is clearly visible and needs to be done away with. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also, and also, people were in light-coloured overalls to train them out of the habit of just wiping their filthy hands on their overalls, which of course <laughs> is the most practical way of doing that. But you know, people were trained into using rags to yeah. to wipe their hands on and 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 clean their tools with, and then you know, and and generally not make a mess of things. Mm. So. <laughs> I thought, that, very I thought that was it. Yes, very. very but, but yeah, but this is this is the sort of didactics I'm talking about. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, you, so you you generally civilizing influence. So that's <laughs> that's cute. And in the meantime, from decade to, to decade, the school would just continually have difficulties with enough space. And and of course, this also is is completely understandable when you realize the. The, the enormous increase of, of technical capabilities and of types of machines and of types of technologies, especially after the Second World War. Mm. I mean, of course, they could start with things like uh, stone and wood uh, at the end of the 19th century, but by the middle of the 20th century, there was, of course, uh, uh, a vast, uh, vast terrains of new expertise on gas and electricity yeah. and all sorts of engines and uh, and of course the, those were those were very popular uh, specializations <laughs> um, uh, car repair yeah yeah new so, and exciting things to tackle yes yes exactly. <laughs> for young minds <laughs> yeah yeah, and and you know all the uh, all the all the uh, the machines that became available. Of course, they they had to be designed, and they had to be built, and they mm. had to they had to be kept up. And uh, yeah, and the, the, well, yeah, young people were quite interested in that. Yeah, and and of course the school would the school would provide uh, trips to uh, airports and uh, well technical facilities and show them how it was done. Mm. They did this uh, uh, later on in the existence of the school because there is this there is this story of an earlier period where they had been for months been educated about about steam technology and the design and the functioning of steam engines without ever seeing one. <laughs> and then when they when they find when they finally got into the into the uh, machine room of a of a ship. They were just absolutely elated to finally see an actual steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's not very practical for practical education to do it like <laughs> that, obviously. Yeah. So we said that they uh, always had students and that they were sort of getting crowded. Did they expand as well? Yeah, they, 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 um, there were extensions added to the, uh, to the building in, in, in week. And then they were starting to use other buildings in yeah. other places as well, and it was it was just overcrowded and impractical and 
Massey uh, mm. until uh, uh, the 1980s, really. Then new schools were built. And by that time, they, they had also um, the, the same sort of sorting out of, of fields and so specialties and, and levels that had taken place in the 19th century. This same sort of shifting process occurred in the 20th. And this crystallized into a, so, a sort of basic school for, for the people with the least capabilities. Okay who, who uh, uh, the authorities uh, still wanted to keep in school for a few years before mm. unleashing them on the world and uh, providing them with with some capability of you know fending for themselves in the in the world of the grown up but you know these these kids were not capable of learning a trade okay there there is always a segment of society still you know al always so now too to, to whom this applies, there there are people who are just not capable, yeah. And you know, and and they shouldn't. They should be. They should be assisted, and of course, they should be educated uh, as far as their capabilities go. And there and there, and there was a there was a special branch of the school for that, and then there was the um, the craftsmanship. Uh, on the on the, the the more basic craftsmanship and then uh, trades on a on a on a higher uh, level requiring more intelligence and more capabilities in in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Then in the so so you had in Maastricht you had a, a, a range that comprised three levels of technical education. Mm -hmm. And then at 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 a few cities in the country. There would be the uh, the higher technical schools. Okay, so did people from Maastricht often? So if they were that uh, level, would they go elsewhere to learn? Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. did a lot of people come back and implement those things? Because I no. assume no. What kind? No. What kinds of things were like the high tier of? The higher technical school, the HTS, that doesn't exist anymore. I'm not really sure, but you know, <laughs> the, the people who would go there would have would have done a theoretical uh, secondary school. They would not have been in trade school, generally okay. speaking. Right. They would have they would have done uh, atheneum or gymnasium in the in the Dutch system. So those are secondary schools, which take six years which give you, at least for the first few years, the full range of the humanities and the sciences. Okay. And then these, the, the kids who would be so inclined would be, would be choosing uh, to concentrate on the sciences. And then if they graduate after six years, they could go on to the higher technical school. So this is a completely different crowd from those, yeah. in, the, from those in the trade schools. And people going to the higher technical school, they'd come out engineers. Yeah, okay. So uh, engineers in, 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 in waterworks, which of course we need a lot of in this country. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and engineers in all sorts of technical fields. Yeah, and then, okay. And then, and then the, there's one more, there's the technical university. Ah, okay. And for that also, you need you need uh, a VWO uh, uh, graduate to be a, a VWO graduate, a voorbereidend wetenschappelijk, so pre-academic, yeah. and that is and that is the six years of either atheneum or gymnasium. But again, totally different crowd, totally different field. I mean, these yeah. are the scientists. Yeah, and so that's not how it currently works, or is that how it no, sort of still no, works? I am. I am I am describing the current system. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I am describing the current system. There are there are still all the trades uh, and that's all of them, not not just the wood and the metal, electricity and 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 cars, but also all the all the service and hospitality and yeah. care professions. Yes. And and also uh, uh, hairdressers and okay, what's that yeah. called? The, uh, nail technicians. Yeah, like I don't know what yeah, that, yeah. Uh, cosmetology type. <laughs> yeah, hair, makeup, yeah. nails, waxing, yes. that kind of thing. <laughs> yes, all of that. All all those all those trades okay. are now in in what we call VMBO, the 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 voorbereidend middelbaar beroepsonderwijs. So, right. so the uh, the preparatory stages of 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 uh, trades, but they you know they give you a diploma. You yeah. will be a, a you you will not leave that school 
without qualifications. And to get the qualifications, you also have to train with an employer. Yes. Okay. So, and what what age is that from then? Those trade schools. All of the secondary education in yeah. the Netherlands starts at twelve. Okay. It's it's very interesting because it's very different from uh, yeah. where I come from, which is primary school until eleven or twelve, and then high school from twelve to eighteen. But we mm-hmm. also do have. Um, it might have changed a bit now, but we have TAFE in at least in New South Wales, because uh, Australia is different in the different states. Which mm-hmm. TAFE and that is far more like what you are describing, where you have um the different trades, and you pr- I think you probably have to do work experience or some kind of internship mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Yeah. But and some people do do that alongside school, but a lot of people yeah. will do that after school. After yeah. you f- high school, so yeah. it's re- it's interesting to me that that is sort of incorporated into those uh, teenage years of of learning. So you get a, a bit yeah. of a head start on people <laughs> in Australia. Yeah, yeah and there's there, there's levels of that in the Netherlands as well. So there is there is the variety where you will be primarily uh, working uh, for a boss and learning on the job, yeah. and you will only go to school for one day a week. And there's the variety where you will be at school more yes, and okay. and working with the boss less, and that 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 gives you that gives you a higher level qualification. Okay. So it's so it's um, yeah, there's there's something for everybody, and of course when the when the, the the social determination was even stronger than it is today, so uh, the Dutch expression if you are born to be a 10 cent piece you are never going to be a 25 cent piece <laughs> was still absolutely uh, valid of course it would happen that kids from from uh, a poor family from a from a working workers family a laborers background would would go into the lower technical school the LTS and then prove so capable that they could go on to the MTS the uh, middle level technical school and okay. be uh, smart enough to go on to the HTS, the higher technical school. Yeah. So you did not, it, it, is, it is not necessarily so that you need to graduate from, from the six year secondary schools, autonomy and gymnasium to go to the HTS. You can take the long route too. Of course that still happens, uh, yeah. except, now, except now that is, that is often um, a different demographic. It, it, uh, this, this sort of learning route seems to be taken more by people from uh, a different uh, <sighs> racial background these days. So, so children, uh, children from migrant communities, which you know, by now you shouldn't really consider migrants anymore because they've been here for three generations so please you know yeah. let let's stop that nonsense okay. the, it is it is still the case that they uh, that they will be uh, rated as of uh, in some cases as of lower capability than their than yeah. their uh, white counterparts yeah mm-hmm. so that's interesting but it's you know this this uh, educational barrier for migrant communities is uh, getting lower and lower and lower mm. for, for for these people every year so it's you know it's 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 just a matter of time when when yeah. there's you know four generations five generations and you know it it'll be gone yeah i know there's a lot of uh increasing accommodations for people who might speak a different language at home and then speak English with their friends and who are like bilingual, especially in Australia yeah. where most people, well, a large number of people uh, are just speak English. Um, yeah. I know there's sort of, and you might, they might think that their English is interesting or not quite up to the right level, but they don't realize that this five-year-old child speaks several languages at home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I think... Yeah. I think that people are increasingly aware of that. The uh, one thing I was wondering is when were uh, girls introduced into the uh, school we're talking about? I have been searching for that. I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> they snuck and, in and, over time. <laughs> yeah, they snuck in over time. So that, that is what I, that is what I was saying. The the the, uh, the contemporary uh, video clips of the of yeah. the, the schools that came out of the Ambacht school. 
uh, and, there, and there's several of them. In all of the clips, there are girls. Uh, so, but the the Ambacht school, the building that we were talking about in Wiek, that was deserted in the middle of the 1980s, and I have I have seen no mention of girl students being admitted before that time. Okay. I mean, the, the the story of the building uh, after it was left becomes very very dreary uh, because it was. Um, all the all the uh, amenities were disconnected, so there was no electricity and no gas and no mm. water, and it was boarded up. But in the 1980s, uh, Maastricht still had a big problem with uh, junkies, with uh, people okay. addicted to heroin, and they were uh, they were sleeping rough and they were begging in the streets and they were leaving their uh, there are hypodermic needles everywhere, and um, it was it was a real problem. And of course, they would always be on the lookout for places to to stay, uh, you know, have their hustles. And so they they broke into the into this boarded up school and sort of yeah, practically demolished it. About the the, the fire department would have to go there about once a week to put out uh, a fire because yeah, there was nothing there so they would be breaking yeah. out the, the the closets and the floorboards and and to light a fire and then yes. of course the the building would catch on flames and so it was yeah it, it the, the whole school became the whole building became became just uh, a spot that the that the people of the town dreaded and tried to avoid, and yeah. the authorities tried tried to clean up. And I have found no information about what they actually did with the junks, the junkies, when the yeah. when when they finally decided on uh, building uh, the large movie theater, uh, incorporating the old school. Mm. But uh, that is what eventually happened. These uh, these uh, illegal Occupants were moved out, okay. but parts of the building were demolished, and the uh, the movie theater was constructed. So then we then we had uh, a series of uh, five beautiful uh, movie theaters there together, mm -hmm. and uh, that that closed in uh, last year. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, so now, <laughs> there's this there's this empty building sitting there again. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And there's, I, I don't think the, the the junkies of today will still try to occupy it. That's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Also, in in what used to be the old uh, Ambacht School, so in the in the in the brick building, mm -hmm. um, there is um, it. It is also being used uh, by the by the neighborhood as their as their uh, uh, town hall. Okay. So me nice. meeting space and uh, practice space and uh, yeah, community space. That's yeah. that's basically what it is. And the the old building also houses a collection of um, yeah. In Dutch, we have the marvelous word for that: bedrijfsverzamelgebouw. It means <laughs> it means a collection of little companies building. That's what it means literally. Oh, okay. So it is it is a it is a building that houses not one company but a lot. Of little ones, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they can they can share facilities and yeah. you know and, and very uh, practical, very yes, handy. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, si since the Netherlands has this enormous amount of of, of self-employed people uh, barely surviving, mm. uh, this sort of thing is uh, good to have. Very interesting. Uh, did you yeah. have anything else you wanted to add about the school? No, I think I think that'll do. We, the, I am, I am sure you'll you'll find lots of lots of lovely pictures again of uh, <laughs> all these all these boys drawn up in their uh, in their overalls <laughs> or in their uh, beautiful suits when they would have their how would you call that they would they would go to a to a a, a large uh, Franciscan convent as well to have their. Oh. Uh, it's it's not it's not a vacation and it is not actually studying but it's uh, you know it's a break from school and home life. I don't know what you'd call that. We used to go to camp, <laughs> like school camp, but a bit fancy. Yeah, yeah but th yeah, this looks much too sophisticated to be camp. Like they're, they're all wearing suits and ties. 
Yeah, well, I, mean, I never wore a suit on school camp, to be no, fair. No. <laughs> Contemporary kids don't either. But it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's uh, and and they played sports together, and it's and 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 this was this happened at at most of the Maastricht schools. It was the it was the same at the one I went to. So never mind never mind the level of the school. There would be sports and very competitive <laughs> sports, and the and the um, the teachers would uh, would play against the students, and they. Uh, <laughs> And I'm I, I I really I really loved when I saw what the what the teacher soccer team called itself. They <laughs> um, they thought they should uh, they thought they should call themselves the uh, the KK team, and what that <laughs> what that stood for was uh, the Kinderkruier, and that is that is a, a very succinct uh, dialect designation of uh, people who will pester children <laughs> <laughs> which is of course what they did yes um i have not i have not talked about the war because of course that was as for everybody and everything else that was a that was a difficult period yeah uh school school was uh not on for for quite a while, and and especially mm. not at the at the end of the war when all the repatriating of people was going on. So so people were people were coming back from the concentration camps and needed to be tended to, de de loused and and you know yeah nursed back to health. And the school was used for that. And um, but before that happened, the the Germans spent the, the German occupational forces spent the last few weeks of the occupation of Maastricht in the building and and pretty much uh, took everything they could carry. Wow! And then after the liberation, the Americans were there and used it as a sort of headquarters. And you know, so so when the school got the building back, um, they sort of had to. St- Start by rebuilding the building, as you can well imagine. Yeah. But of course, that 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 happened to a lot of buildings in the city. Well, if you're a listener out there somewhere who uh, has been to the school, there might be someone who's been who uh, went to the school. It'd be really interesting to hear some yes. first-hand experiences. Uh, yes. Since it's been around for so long. Yeah. Uh, there's got to be someone. <laughs> Yeah, because it it has been it has been uh, this particular building has been used as a school until the uh, the middle of the 1980s. So so there yeah. should be people in their in their uh, 50s, 60s, 70s who have gone to school there. <laughs> yeah, uh, we won't ask how old you are though. We promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are we going to talk about next week? Have we picked a topic? Yes, I did. I have, and it's be, because I'm a little intrigued by by why it is called this. It is, it is number seventy six in the range, so it's a fairly recent one. And it says it says the bank buildings on the market. Oh, yeah, <laughs> not like a a proper name. It's sort of no, the bank what, buildings what, on the market. The bank buildings. Yeah, no. What this what this is is the is the uh, let me think here the west. Wall of the of the market square. So it's the it's the row of rather magnificent mansions facing the front of city hall. Ah, and they, okay. And they, and they, they're huge, and they have enormous um, attics. So yeah. roofs that roofs that rise up almost as high as the height of the building, as the rest yeah. of the building. And it's and I and I suppose. The booklet has been called the bank buildings because so many of these magnificent houses, which were not built for banks, have been used by banks <laughs> and and still are okay. to some to some extent. So yeah. something different again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we look forward to learning about the mansions. Good. Thank you so much for listening to the Meet Maastricht podcast. To keep up to date with all our content and events, make sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at at Meet Maastricht and on Facebook at Come Meet Maastricht. If you love our podcast and would like to see some amazing archival images as you listen, don't forget to subscribe to the Meet Maastricht YouTube channel. If you love what we do and would like to support the Meet Maastricht team, you can also donate through PayPal via our website meetmaastricht.eu. 
Meet Maastricht is definitely a labour of love and all of the revenue we make through our tours and events currently goes towards administration costs. With your help, we would love to be able to give back a little something to the team so we can all keep bringing you our favourite stories and showing you our favourite places in Maastricht. Thanks again and tune in next time to learn more about our beautiful city. Tot ziens.